Lee Riley is my name from Ben Mullet and um, a priest of the Diocese of Kilala working in Ballina at the moment. And five years ago, back five years now, it's uh, hard to believe, but always and ever since I was very, very young, I wanted, I always felt called to give some portion of my life to, um, to people in the developing world. Um, and it's just something that has been at me, if you like, all of my life. And thanks be to God, 10, 11 years ago, uh, it, it, the opportunity presented itself. I was absolutely delighted and I grasped it with both arms. It's a very challenging thing. Um, I, do, it's not, I suppose here, in my mind, I thought it was getting on a plane, and getting over there, and getting off plane and doing it. But it's a challenging thing. For, for instance, 10 years ago on Ash Wednesday, I had my first Ash Wednesday in, in South America. My Spanish was tragic. And uh, Ash Wednesday is like it is here in Ireland. There were hundreds of people all day long and all the different mass centres, we had mass all day basically. And uh, so on that day I made a very fatal mistake that I'll never forget and I always share. Uh, I said to poor people, rather than eris polbo, he had polbo i the bear, I said eris pavo. So instead of saying dust thou art, and then to dust you shall return, I said you're a turkey, and into a turkey you won't do a turkey. So they've, they've, they've really... They've really hated Christmas since that, but, um, <laughs> but no, it, it's, it, it was an extraordinary, challenging uh, period of my life, uh, and yet a, a really rewarding period of my life. It, when I decided to go to Ecuador, um, it was as if everything was taken. I was six years in a parish called Rossport, north of here, and uh, uh, I had become familiar with the things of parish and ministry, albeit early days. And all of a sudden, I was the other side of the world. Everything that was familiar to me was taken away. Uh, it was like I was back in the pram, like a baby, and people would Google Gaga to me, and I would do the same to them. And uh, it was it was like you were starting again. It was an unbelievable experience, but a beautiful experience. And I always say that Lent, you know, because we talk about Lent as a time of decluttering or whatever. And I thought, you know, people think I'm mad because. It was the most liberating and beautiful experience of my life to be able to shed all the layers that I had accumulated here in Ireland and be able to, to uh, pack a small suitcase to go to the other side of the world and that was me, that was all I had and I was delighted to do that and it was a wonderful experience, very humbling but, but a wonderful experience. So you might say why, why go to, to Ecuador? I joined the Society of St. James, they're based in Boston, you might remember in the 1960s, John the 23rd, uh, St. John the 23rd, uh, of beautiful memory, uh, he um, invited the diocese in the North, North America, he invited them to reach out to their southern neighbours, to support them, to sustain them and strengthen them. And uh, that's what they did. Most of the diocese in North America did that. The only one that survived was Boston. And the, the, the outreach in Boston was called the Society of St. James. So I joined the Society of St. James uh, because I honestly, somewhere in my life, I believed what Pope Francis has said recently, poverty calls us to sow, sow hope. If we cannot do that, then you, you wonder what's the point. Poverty is the flesh of the poor Jesus in that child who is hungry, in the one who is sick, in those unjust social structures. Oscar Romero said that 30 years Ago, the same thing basically. We must not seek the child Jesus in the pretty figures of the Christmas crib. We must seek him among the undernourished children who have gone to bed at night with nothing to eat, among the poor newsboys who will sleep covered with newspapers indoors. Leonardo Boff, the Brazilian, said something even more radical, I suppose. He said, The poor are the point from which one attempts to conceive of God, Christ, grace, history. The mission of the churches, the meaning of the economy, politics, the future of societies and of the human being. Basically, the poor are the lowest common denominator. And I suppose it's from a combination of those three quotes that, that I ended up um, being motivated to share some of my life with the people in Ecuador. I ended up in the city of Guayaquil. Guayaquil is of three million people. Ecuador is a country of extremes. Four, three or four percent extreme wealth that you wouldn't see in Ireland, and 95, 96 percent extreme poverty, thankfully, that you won't see in Ireland either. Um, it's a, a, I ended up in a place called 
Valerio Stasio, this was about a fortnight after I got there in, in 2007. The priest who was there is from the islands, the Outer Hebrides, called McGinnis, a wonderful man. He just had a heart attack and he was having open heart surgery. So they invited me to go in just to um, fulfill the sacramental um, uh, schedule that was ongoing in the parish and just to try and keep things going until he had, uh, because he had done such a wonderful job. He had, he had, he had built a, a parish centre, a parish house, a medical centre across the road, and a wonderful job. But Valeria Stasio, I remember the first day, as clear as if tonight, I walked, I was in a, with a Scottish priest, and uh, I came out to my new sandals and new uh, trial, whatever, and I walked down the street, and it was the 12th of January 2007, and it was the beginning of the rainy season, and the streets just turned to muck. Absolute muck. And it would have been up very close to my knees, and I just kept slogging along anyway, down the street. And I remember clear as day, the first thing that struck me was the stench. The absolute stench of poverty. You know, for years I would look at the Joker box and thought I understood poverty. But there was nothing, nothing can prepare you for the stench. And I wondered, would I ever get used to it? You know, from the sewage on the side of the streets, from the raw meat that they were trying to sell on the, on the, street, on the, on the little stands at the start of the street, bits of fish, whatever they could get their hand on, they were trying to sell. And just that stench, I couldn't, it was so overpowering. I wondered, would I ever, ever get, get to come to grips with it? But I remember going down that street and in my own mind having a, a, you know, a catechism really, and I heard this voice, hello my friend! And I was delighted because I said, oh, somebody speaks English like that. So I looked around, there was this uh, African Ecuadorian who was um, selling two battered fish on the side of the road. And uh, he called me. So I was delighted and I was chatting to him. He said, My name is George Washington. <laughs> I said, oh, for God's sake. No, he's taken he's taken the, the uh, white guy for a walk, you know. So I said, Oh yeah, you're right. He said, Yeah, my name is George Washington. So I said, I, I don't believe that. And he had two battered fish in front of him, trying to sell them to make a few pounds for the day. And I said, I don't believe that. So the next day, just just to, to, to finish that. The next day I was walking down and he called me again and he had his little second lap and surely enough his name was Jorge Washington. Mm -hmm. And the thing was that there's a little province in Ecuador called Esmeraldas and during the slave trade uh, the boats would go to the western, uh, the western coast of South America, travel up and one of them, the story is, one of them got shipwrecked off Esmeraldas. Esmeraldas was jungle, total jungle, and they were washed ashore and they cut their way in and uh, formed a city which is about 120,000 now, Esmeraldas, the city. And the province is a province of uh, probably 97% African Ecuadorians. And most of them, a lot of them, uh, took the names of American presidents, which was interesting. So you meet Clintons, you meet Bushes, you meet Washingtons, you meet Lincolns, you meet all of the, for some reason, they took the names of, of American presidents. But anyway, that was Jorge. And I, I continued down the street as far as I could go. And I came across the chapel, that, that building there. And uh, that area is Valerio Stasio. And it's called after a man, a gangster. Valerio is his first name, the Stasio, the surname. They're criminals. What they do is they commandeer a piece of land that's owned by the wealthy elite in a certain city. And they mark it out. And they go to the country. And they invite people on the promise of a better life, the bright lights in the big city. And they initially herd them into, into lorries. And you'll find in a place like Valerio Stasio, one sector will be from Manabe, the city, the other sector will be from Manta. And the reason is they've come off the same lorry. They're literally like going to the Martin Val. They're, they're, they're shooed onto, the, onto this lorry, driven into the city, and, and just left. So they get a piece of land, 
four meters, five meters squared, and they have to stay there until they can build a house. So very often you'll find people who, who are, have four pens and a little bit of plastic over them, nothing else, and they can't leave it because it'll be taken on them. And their commitment is one dollar a week for the rest of their lives there. So it's a huge thing because Valerio Stasio is a parish of 100,000 people. So, and these, Valerio, our friend, he, um, he has his enforcers who go around every week to collect the money and violence is not, not, uh, it's not beyond them. You know, I mean, it's very much part of the repertoire, unfortunately. But um, that's how, so you'll find people and then eventually they'll get the resources to build little huts, usually game huts. Um, they're built on stilts, and uh, it's chaotic. There's no order. I know sometimes we give out about planning in Ireland, but this this, this is worse. They, they build anywhere they can get a little bit of the space, anywhere that Valerio gives them permission, they'll build, and and they're delighted. Just so it's nearly on top of each other. The 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 streets. I mean, they're not streets. They're just dirt paths. Uh, there's no water. The water turns up twice a week on the tanker and uh, they have a barrel outside the door. Every house has a barrel, you'll we'll see in a minute. And they fill the tanker, 70 centavos to fill the tank, the barrel. And everything happens around the barrel. They wash themselves, they, they cook, everything happens. I saw a woman one day, she came out with a jug in her hand, she took the lid off the barrel, put it into the, was going to put it into the barrel, reached in with the other hand and took out a cat who had died. It was, he had gone in for uh, something to drink and uh, didn't get out again. And she just threw it to one side, put in the jug, put on the lid, and went into the house, and, and I presume went about her, her, her cooking or whatever, rice or whatever. But it would have killed us, I'd say. But the, the constitutions were just, I suppose, a bit stronger than ours, and we were more used to it. But no water, no sewage, absolutely, as you can see, it, it was just find a spot, uh, no sewage whatsoever. No electricity. Very often you'll find that the people nearest the most established um, uh, settlement would, would get a piece of cable and steal electricity from the neighbouring uh, established. So you'll find this kind of network that's just so dangerous and so haphazard. And every, almost every night a house would burn down because of the connections were so poor. And uh, they, they, they often have tragic, tragic consequences. I remember. Um, one of the first Sundays I was there, um, just the images stayed in your mind, and it wouldn't be an unusual one, but it was because it was one of my first time. This family came to me after Mass, 9 o'clock Mass in Valerio, and um, they said, Father, I thought this image would come and bless our child. And I said, I'd love to after the Masses. We had seven Sunday Masses, it was five in the morning, two in the evening. And uh, I said, I would after the morning. So uh, one of them came back for me after the last Mass. We went down. And I climbed up into one of the houses, and uh, just and there was about probably ten or a dozen people sitting around, and it was very silent. And this little lady came up to me, and she had what I suppose reminded me of a milk, a milk, a milk um, jug. No, the, the plastic bottle. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah the, with the top kind of cut off, and she just thrust it into my hand, and I, I held it, and in the, in the plastic was the little baby, and dead. And uh, it just struck me. Uh, I looked down and thought, oh my God, you know, and what? So they wanted to bury the baby. And of course, I was very naive at the time. And I said, well, we bury the baby. We give it a proper burial. We go to the cemetery. And we got into my pickup truck, going to the cemetery to give the baby. But it costs a lot of money to die, as you know. In, in South America, it's worse. The cemeteries are walled communities as well. And only the super wealthy get in. So. Then we got back to the house and we picked a spot under the house and they buried the baby there. And um, it just struck me. <coughs> I know we say it often, death is part of life, but it literally is there, you know? It literally is. Another time, Diego's living beside the church and uh, I'll go to him, he's a young lad, 20, 21. And I'll go to him every Sunday just to stay alone and bring him communion and that and uh, have a chat. But one day I went, uh, over after nine o'clock as well, and uh, climbed up into the house, into the house, and the family were eating. The houses are divided in two. There's a living area and a sleeping area, and everybody sleeps on that side. Everyone eats and sits around on the side. So I went to them; they were, they were there, and I said, uh, "Diego, dónde está? Where is he?" And they said, "Está dentro." So I went in, 
And there was just this lump in the corner rolled into a blanket. And it was just flies, covered in flies. I, I thought, oh my God. So I went back out and I said, when did he die? He said, he died on Wednesday, but we don't have the money to bury him. And they were eating their breakfast, you know, it was after nine o'clock, they were eating something. And I just thought, oh, it was as normal as, you know, day following night. And we, we did take him, because there was some support, and we did take him. And we got a family, a little family plot in another cemetery and buried him. But uh, I remember another, Another um, situation that, that happened also in, um, in Valerius last year during the rainy season, I think I have a photo of it actually, where I, I went in on a tractor to the Mass Centre just to celebrate Mass, and uh, I was looking up, this man brought me in and brought me out, and the place was just totally and utterly flooded. And um, as we went in, a, a canoe passed in front of us. And, um, <laughs> so as we were going into the mass, there was a place called San Bernabé, St. Barnabas. We were going in and a canoe passed in front of us. And I noticed in the canoe there was the remnants of, of, of a life. There was a, a, a closed stone all over the place. There was a mother, there was two children, and the father was in the water behind them, pushing the canoe. I just thought, it looks like their entire life is there. I seem to remember them having a washing machine as well, but I don't know where that came out of. But I remember saying, what happened? And they said, well, <clears throat> during the night, the house fell. The stilts, the stilts, one of the stilts gave way, and the whole house fell into the water. And we lost everything, but the worst thing was that, that um, while we, while the house fell into the water, our baby fell into the water as well. And it was only then I noticed the mother at the top of the canoe had a little bunny on her arms that was wrapped up in, in a blanket. And they, he was as matter of fact, he said, you know, I said, what's the point now? And he said, well, we're just going to her sister's place and we're going to build something beside her and we're going to, you know, get on with it. And just thought, you know, it, it's just a different way of life. It's, uh, and I know that's that's a taken, but it's a different way of seeing things. There's no planning for tomorrow in this, in the slum, at least where I lived. Uh, and that was frustrating for a Westerner, because we kind of plan ourselves <coughs> to death. We have plans for next year and, and, and two years' time, and, and, but there's no planning for tomorrow in, 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 in the slum. You literally live today, and you try and get through today, and, and, and then take on tomorrow when the time comes. And we did a chicken project um, with, with people who thought it might be a way of supplementing their income. So the idea was to buy a hundred little chickens and to feed them for six weeks and be ready for the market and uh, the cost would be about 300 Euro, uh, dollars, the dollars in Ecuador, uh, 300 dollars. But to sell them you would make another three, so you make six, 600 selling them on the, on the market in the city. So it would be a tiny little profit, but the idea, the catch was you had to keep it to reinvest it for another hundred. And it was so frustrating because it would never done. And the projects almost always died because they just couldn't see that far ahead. You know, they, 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 they were literally just living for the moment, mindfulness. And just living for the moment. It was, it was, um, and, and, and it's frightening that people, that's as far ahead as they could, as they could, uh, as they could see. I just put this in, because when I went to Ecuador, it was, it was kind of, this image of life was it's kind of like a scribble on a choker box or something, you know, it, it just wasn't real, or a painting in an art gallery or something like that. But, but then it just it just became part of my life for, for six years, and I feel so blessed that it was part of my life. Valerio Stasio was a place where, I think I said to you, Pat, one time, it was a place where, you know, murder, mayhem, and, and mass. It, it, it was that kind of place, it was a place of contradictions. The, the, the murder was an everyday event. Um, it's just, we're so blessed, and I always say to people that we have such a peaceful existence generally, but like their murder was part of life. It was just, it was taken. Every night there was, there was, there was chaos, um, mayhem. Um, across the road from where I lived, we had Junior, who was the, the Latin kings of the mafia, 
of the Latin community, and he was the local king. Junior was his name, and got on really well with his granny and his mother. They, were mad, they used to come to mass, and we got on really, really well. But I remember him telling me that when he became king, you know, he said, will you pray for me when, I, when, I, when they get me? You know, will you pray for me? And so his life was over when he became the local king. Mm -hmm. And uh, ironically, I felt very, very safe while he was alive because nothing, nothing would happen while he was there. My mother came out, as Irish mothers do, she had this image of Ecuador as the worst place in the world, you know, it was hell on earth, and uh, she thought the, she, in her mind she had it built up to be really horrendous. I suppose it was in parts, but I remember one day we were driving back, it was the day before she flew home, and uh, I thought we had really shielded her from all of the uh, any negativity or whatever. But we were driving in, and I noticed outside the church on the steps there was there was a crowd gathering, and there was a body on the steps. And I thought, oh no, this is the last thing I want now. And we tried to go back to bed, mother, with this image of a dead body on on Lean's church. <laughs> I thought, oh God. So I, I, I turned to one side and drove off, and then got into the back and just brought her upstairs, and that was it, done. But um, but that was part of it, and it's frightening to think. When I think back now, I think, oh, was it really? But it was just so much part of life. The gangs were the only option. There was no employment. The only employment was some people would have a little window in their house and they'd put a, a can of coke or a bottle of coke and sell it in cups, make a little profit. Others were lucky enough to work as slaves in the wealthy side. Uh, I say lucky enough with, with irony. Uh, they worked in the wealthier side of the city, usually as slaves. Most of them lived in the houses, didn't get to leave the houses. They would meet one of their families at the gate and hand through the wage and go back in. So they were separated from the families completely. And the third was prostitution. Uh, that was the, a lot of the women would unfortunately get caught up in the prostitution racket or be forced into the prostitution racket. So it was, um, it was just a surreal kind of existence. And, um, and the gangs were the, <coughs> the gangs were the, just such a, an attractive option for a young 13 or 14 year old lad who had no money, had no prospects and couldn't see beyond tomorrow. I mean, how could he resist the prospect of maybe having a few hundred dollars in his hand from a drug deal down the road or, 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 um, or, or something worse? Um, but the, so there was such an, an attractive option, tragically, for most of the young people in, in, um, in Bolivia. This is the rainy season, March, around this time of year, um, eight years ago. The rains just swamped us in, from about Christmas to June. The place just filled up with water and, uh, and, and also mosquitoes and all the attendant um, complications they bring with them. Um, boats, of course, with the taxis. Um, they would go around from house to house bring people mm -hmm. supplies if they needed supplies or this, that, and the other um, canoes. There's one that we sank earlier. Uh, it just got too much for it. Um, they're, ju they're just the houses. I mean, you can see they're just literally plants there on a, on a wheelish ground, is kind of out of the water. And um, in the more houses. This is a new, new invasion, a part of the invasion where people are just literally uh, trying to uh, move their way into the, the growth there. Another family. So this is one of our chapels in San Bernard Bay. It's a small little chapel, uh, but yet a place that that fills some water just underneath, and um, their belongings. It's very very basic. Sometimes you notice, and my sisters pointed this out to me, that you notice the children with Nike tops and sometimes Adidas tops and that kind of thing. So oh, for them, but they're always they're donations sent from the first world and uh, they come from. United States or from Europe, and they'll, uh, they'll look the part, but uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't happen. A friend of mine one time went to Celtic Parkhead in, in Glasgow, and Tommy Johnston died, Jimmy Johnston died, and um, there were thousands of Celtic jerseys outside Parkhead, and he asked what he wants to do with them, and he said, if you want to, you can take them. So he said, I will, I will take them. So he got a container, filled them with all the jerseys. So there's one part of the North Waikiki where everybody was going around in Celtic jerseys. <laughs> Mothers, fathers, everybody had the Celtic jerseys. Yeah. It was lovely. But um, 
they're just a family again, their, their house has kind of um, suffered during the night with, with rains and that, but um, canoeing. <laughs> That's the family that lost everything. The mother, unfortunately, I didn't, I hated taking photos because you're kind of the tourist and yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's disrespectful in some level. Uh, but I, I, I just took a photo of, of, as quick as I could. I was up in the tractor, but uh, the mother was just out of shot. But they had lost everything and they were just going to try and find it over beyond uh, where her sister lived, who we were going to start again. Um, again, you can just see uh, you really have to be there in the heat and the mosquitoes and the it's just a very oppressive uh, place to live. Um, you can also see a house with bed inside. Um, they would chance it if they thought there was no chance of the authorities coming out there. They would chance it to build a house and try and live there as long as they could without being moved and disturbed. Um, as often as we could, when we did have the donations, we would try and put together little parcels, um, food parcels, uh, rice, um, um, flour, uh, sugar, all of the basics. There were seven or eight that they always desperately needed. Christmas Day was a great day for it. People used to say, well, how was Christmas Day in Ecuador? Christmas Day was, a, was the day, the morning, was the day when we would uh, go with the parcels uh, for the Christmas. Uh, so most of Christmas morning, you would find yourself in a, in a canoe if it was rainy, or in the truck, uh, delivering to the worst parts of, of, of the parish. There again, you have another guy going to his this is a family just, just receiving um, a little parcel. It's not huge, but it's a help for them, and uh, they're, they're happy to, uh, to receive. Um, this is just the, the, the rainy season again. Sister Gladys was a religious sister of Las Marinitas, which is an Ecuadorian congregation, and she came and they built a house, and she lived um, literally on the street with them, those, those three sisters, uh, uh, inspirational people in every sense, um, wonderful, wonderful people uh, who gave their lives to just to try to, in some way, um, make life better for, for, for these people, in some small way. Um, the thing about Valeria Stasio too was that nobody, no taxi man would ever go to it, ever drive there. The buses would go, there was little window during the day when the buses would go in through the main street and out the other side. But uh, nobody wanted to be there. Um, it just had this kind of reputation. And um, I suppose when I look back, <coughs> and when I, when, as part of the church in Ireland, and when I look back to that, I, I often think that's, that's where we should, should be, you know, where people don't want to go, um, where people cannot go. Uh, it's with those people we should be. I often feel that. I, I really do feel passionate about that, that it's with those most in need. That, that we should be. So often we get caught in our ivory towers or our ivory palaces or whatever they are. And I think, I'm not sure if that's, if that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I just, I really passionately believe that, that if we are to live that gospel, and I'm not saying that we all protect it or we'll do it where we are, but that we must be with the most needy um, and, and uh, the, the, the most marginalized and the most isolated and the most excluded and um, they are in our own communities as well. Uh, but we, we should never, I think one of the things about the church in Latin America, certainly after the conquistadores in the 15th century was that it was associated with the conquistadores, the Spaniards, uh, because the missionaries did go with the Spaniards. And so the indigenous communities <coughs> associated the two very much, these people who came in to conquer us, and the missionaries were, were all seen as as we were working together. And, um, and, and unfortunately, that has, that has continued right down to the present day, where people still associate um, the church with, 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 to a certain extent with the, with the power structure in, in that society, which I believe is not where, where, where it should be. Um, it's just a Palm Sunday, where we're um, uh, some, some lads with their trendy t shirts together on the altar. Um, this is more or less what Jorge Washington was standing at, although his wasn't metal, his was um, timber, I remember, and just a two rotting fish on it. But that's more or less what, what, he, was, what he was standing at um, on the streets. 
Um, how's the burnt down after some electrical uh, problems? Um, they took the risk, they joined it up, and unfortunately they suffered the consequences very often. They didn't have the certification that's now necessary in, in Ireland, unfortunately. They didn't. They just uh, they initially threw it over the wire and, uh, and, and hoped for the best. The tankers came twice a week, it was the lady and her son, uh, waiting just for a refill of, of water. Um, 70 cents to fill the car. We were three friends of mine, very close to this chap with San Bernabé, St. Barnabas. Um, this is one of our soup kitchens. Just a quick word about some of the things we were involved in. Uh, we had two soup kitchens, which were very basic, uh, but yet they fed 100 to 120 children, each of them, every day. And uh, they were chaotic places, but, but they were great fun, and they did, I think, they did help. Um, this is on Matteo was looking after this one for us. He was from Chile. Uh, he just came on, to, just to be part of a, a missionary parish for a while, and he, he had to run one of the, uh, the soup kitchens. So it's a bit chaotic, but they do get there. One of the chapels that we built, this is the one on the grounds. This is Santa Teresita, St. Teresa of the Child Jesus, and that was the one that was there beforehand. Uh, a little parish centre where we had courses, catechesis, uh, educational um, events. Obviously education is the way forward. We used to have um, things like the FITAC, I suppose the equivalent um, FITAC 5, FITAC, that kind of training, so that people would be able to break the cycle, go off to the other side of the city and get employment in hospitals or wherever, wherever they could. Childcare was a major problem because <clears throat> there was no sense of commitment whatsoever in the slum. Um, the men ran instead, and, and often women were left with, with children, young children, four, three or four or five, and there was no sense of commitment whatsoever. So they found that mothers were in this horrific situation where they couldn't get out to work, they, they couldn't, there was no way of breaking the cycle. So the only way of breaking the cycle was to, to provide childcare so that the children would be able to be left off, that the mother would be able to go and find work and, and little by little just break, break the, the, the heart of the cycle. And so uh, this was one of our childcare centres. There, there were three rooms, that was one of the rooms. Um, this was another one which was more basic, uh, again at San Bernard Bay. Uh, but it allowed the mothers, usually the mothers, the fathers unfortunately, but usually the mothers, it allowed the mothers to, to, um, to seek employment and to try and break. But of course there's no state aid whatsoever for, for uh, anybody. There is now that has changed slightly, but there was no uh, happy. Was no, this was uh, the Archbishop of Guayaquil, um, and he came one day, we were just starting to build a school, a little school, right out in the middle of nowhere. But, the idea he thought was that eventually the, it would all become very built up, and it has, in fairness. But um, this was more or less the day we started the school, and this is the school which was finished um, about, I forget, about seven months. Another school that we built closer to where I lived, um, all being used, thankfully, today. This is the church, the parish church, was just a roof um, when, when we went there. and. Um, the importance of faith for, for these people, I mean, I couldn't understate the importance of the hope that our Christian faith offered them in a very, very dour um, situation. They really did get consolation from the Word of God, from the sacraments, from their different devotions, Latin community, Latin society is very, very Marian, as you know, and they really did get huge strength and um, um, you know, um, sustain them for, uh, from their, their, um, their Christianity. So, First Holy Communion one day. The thing about First Holy Communion was that they always got uh, a wealthy padrino, or godfather, or godmother. So they made sure they went off to the other side of the city, got somebody wealthy to buy them the dress, or buy them the suit, and uh, it was all about money. <laughs> the, 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 the other spiritual commitment was, wasn't as emphasized. But uh, the padrino would uh, have to cough up to ensure that they looked their very best and that they had a little bit of a party afterwards. But um, 
they, that day, that particular day, they had to all go home and make a new afterwards, which wasn't ideal for the white dresses, but, but nonetheless, that, that was the situation. That was my mother and my sister. We, just today, we were visiting one of the mountains with the indigenous communities. So now, that's just a very quick run through um, the, the situation in Ecuador, um, my, my experience in Ecuador. And I just, maybe just for a moment or two, to tie it into um, the letter of, of Pope Francis and the recent letter about Dr. C, which is a, a wonderful um, encyclical, which is a social encyclical. Um, people almost seem to call it the environmental encyclical, but it's a social encyclical. Nothing radical <coughs> at all. Um, it is in a long line dating back Benedict the sixteenth was uh, said to be the Green Pope. Um, John Paul II spoke about the um, ecological conversion. Um, right back to 1972, when Leonardo Boff published Cry of the Poor, Cry of the Earth, which is basically what Laudato Si speaks about, and the connection between the two cries, and all of that going right back to St. Francis, of course, in the 13th century, and mother, uh, brother, son, and sister, and mother. But um, there are there are many things about about um, the the encyclical. I suppose that can be said, and you're all experts on it. I'm sure at this stage. So I just want to maybe draw on one or two uh, threads that kind of tie in with my experiences in Ecuador. Um, and one of those is this idea that everything is connected. It's something my granny could have told me, and something that all of that generation could have told us that everything is connected. And so much now we've allowed life to become disconnected. And we become disconnected from nature, we become disconnected tragically from each other. Uh, we've allowed technology, and Pope Francis really takes a shot at that, at the, the technocratic mindset. He really, uh, he really aims for that because, uh, as you know, technology is the best thing in the world as long as it serves us, as long as it serves our relationships as long as it serves our community living, as long as it serves our lives as human beings. But when it comes to dominate, as people tell me now, they wake up at four o'clock to check Facebook, um, it, 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 when it comes to dominate us, then it, it, we're entering a very dangerous place. And, um, and Pope Francis really takes a shot, you know, a shot at that mindset very, very strongly in the, uh, in the encyclical. But, but this idea that everything is connected, not just not just ecologically, not just environmentally, but economically as well. I had an argument with a cousin of mine in Eris there, uh, it was probably a good few years ago now, um, about the gas project there. And he was giving out that people from a village in Eris were going to protest in Polythomish. Why did they go down to Polythomish? You think they mind their own business and say, stay where they are. And it was almost as if, you know, that, you know, that there were only a few miles up the road and, and that there was no connection with them whatsoever. And I was thinking, well, what about the Amazon rainforest? What if, what, what if the Brazilians cut it down in the morning? Uh, surely there will be consequences for the, for the entire, for the entire uh, world, for the entire globe. But we had a part of it. The first thing was um, refuse. It's one of the things that reminds us that we're all connected, even in Ireland. You know, a few weeks ago, and I said it on Sunday, I came across a trailer load of rubbish half a mile from that time on the side of the road and I thought, you know, that's, that's disconnection, it's, 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 it's sad and it's a disaster. But I, um, the house that you just saw, the yellow house, the Paris Centre, was built on rubbish dump. All of the rubbish from Guayaquil in the city uh, came, the wealthier parts of the city came and was dumped where we were. When my mom was there, she didn't sleep a wink any night. It suited her because she's a smoker and she would have uh, enjoyed a cigarette anyway. But she didn't sleep a wink any night because at about two o'clock in the morning, the whole place around the house came alive with people. And people would come from all over to, to rummage through the refuse and to open bags and to find if 
there was food, or if there was any kind of leftover, or if there was plastic that they could use to, to, um, to recycle. And it just it, it brought to mind once again the, the connection, the responsibility we have towards each other uh, in terms of, of just that simple thing, the environment. This is pictures that weren't far from the Paris Centre there of just every night it happened. This is one that man who was his name. We actually bought him a, I forget what you call it, it's a bicycle. There's a bicycle there somewhere and it's, it's kind of a bicycle pushing a wheelbarrow, a big glorified wheelbarrow. But he never went to school and every day he was there and, and lots more like him, recycling, going through the rubbish to find if there was a little bit of anything that they could recycle in terms of eating or, or indeed um, plastics uh, to, to make a few dollars. And I think it's probably one of the most obvious ways in which we're all connected um, is with our waste. This is another project, some of you might have heard of this. Yasuni is one of the most beautiful uh, um, parks in, in, in Ecuador. It's the northeast of Ecuador. <coughs> it's, in terms of biodiversity, it's hugely important for the world, not just for Ecuador. It's 10,000 square kilometers, one of the most important areas in, in the Amazon in terms of biodiversity. Um, Yasuni is home to over 130 global threatened species, including all of those animals, and 655 different tree, spe tree species uh, have been identified within one hectare of land. So it's extraordinarily rich uh, in, in terms of biodiversity. Uh, insects, reptiles, frogs and toads, all of those are found in a way that we couldn't possibly understand. Uh, Ninth highest mammal of biodiversity, half of them are found in this little park of 10,000 kilometers. They have found oil there, and they found a lot of oil there. 920 million barrels just under this national park. So in 2007, Rafael Correa, the president, was elected, and he promised that they would never touch the Asuni National Park. And he kept his promise. 2010, uh, he went to the United Nations and begged them to hammer out a deal. And the deal, the proposition was that they would, that the rest of the world would make a contribution. Because Ecuador desperately needed, the value of the oil there was, was seven billion, just north of seven billion dollars. And they desperately needed, there are hospitals in Ecuador, my father doses cattle in places better than some of those hospitals. They were in shocking state, they wouldn't keep animals in them. And they desperately need the seven billion dollars. So Rafael Correa cleverly went to the UN and he said, listen, what we'll do is we'll leave it intact, but I want you to make a commitment to give us half the money, 3.5, 3.6 million billion dollars, and let us get on building our infrastructure, our health um, service, um, our education service. And in fairness to them, they really have begun to do that. Uh, thanks be to God, the money isn't as tough as it used to be. But 3rd of August 2010, the United Nations in, in New York, the deal was signed, and all of the big companies in the world uh, came on board and said, no problem, 3.6 billion, no problem, we'll do it. I just think if we burnt the, the bondholders, we would have paid for it easily. But, uh, but 3.6 billion, three and a half years later, uh, he had a commitment for 200 million just 200 million, and uh, it was a commitment in paper, nothing in reality, no cash. And so, I mean, totally and utterly frustrated, uh, he, he <coughs> tore up the deal, and they started drilling just before Christmas last. Um, again, the interconnection, this place is essential on a global level. The Asuni is essential globally, and yet we didn't have the mindset in the United Nations or in Europe our own government were involved as well. We didn't have the mindset, this is what Pope Francis talks about, the ecological and virtual. It's about, we need to change the way we see the world. We need to, to change the way we see the world around us, our common home. We didn't have the mindset to say, well, but that is our, that is our responsibility too. But rather we said, look after it yourselves, the Ecuadorians, and they've gone in and, and they've started drilling up to 200 wells in, in one of the most important um, biodiversity areas of, uh, in the Amazon. Another thing Ecuador is famous for are the bananas. 
uh, God that do everything with bananas. They boil them, they fry them, uh, and they're gorgeous, all of them, and, um, and very fattening. But uh, they do. I, I spent a year in the mountains with the indigenous communities, and every Monday I would make my way down to the city with a big shop list. But I would drive through miles and miles and miles of banana plantations, mostly Dole and um, Favorita. Dole and uh, I think it was Chiquita or Fife, I mean, one of them. But <coughs> we drive to miles and miles and miles. They produce 6.5. They export 5.5 of that million tons of bananas every year. Uh, Europe uses 4.5 million tons of bananas every year, so Ecuador would supply Europe. But one of the things, uh, not, not even to touch on the uh, trade agreements, which have been oppressive, worked by our government against the Ecuadorian government, uh, I mean, our government in terms of being part of Europe, uh, we have been ruthless against those banana producing countries in terms of our, our um, uh, taxes, we have been ruthless. But other than that, there are a number of issues that were a problem when I was there. First thing was the, the every every bunch of bananas has to be protected by a plastic bag, and the bag is steeped in chemicals, toxic chemicals. And the people who do this work are usually children, eight, nine, and ten. Sometimes adults as well, but usually children. Uh, that's the first thing. And these bags are just. There's no, uh, any, no management strategy, they're just done. The other thing, and more importantly, these banana plantations have sprung up um, around communities. They've swallowed up communities. They've just engulfed communities. So where you have a, um, a need to spray these plantations at least 25 times a year. And what was happening was that the communities were being sprayed as well. And the incidence of cancer in these communities skyrocketed completely and, and you found that, that um, this, this actually was, was a major um, issue in the papers from that when I went there or shortly after I got there that, that people were dying of cancer in these communities that, that the incidents were so high and um, that's just a campaign against them but those plantations are places of exploitation they are places where children are partially exploited so that we can have a banana with our porridge in the morning for a price that, that, that is acceptable to us. And most of those children are, and adults would work for under five dollars a day. What we would try to give the people would be twelve dollars, thirteen, fourteen if we could, but most of them on the plantations would work for five dollars a day and were utterly exploited. Um, there a few years ago, <coughs> the uh, Human Rights Watch in New York found in the course of their work, children as young as eight were exposed to toxic pesticides, used sharp knives, machetes, hauled heavy loads of bananas, drank in sanitary water, and were sexually harassed. Roughly 90% of the children told Human Rights Watch that they were forced to continue working while toxic fun fungicides were sprayed from airplanes flying overhead for their efforts 350 a day. I remember those airplanes flying over as I would drive to the city, and you would get you'd, you'd sense it in your throat very, very quickly. But just again, the, the, this idea that, that, that all of this is interconnected. And we really have to, we really have to, as Pope Francis says, to get our mind around that. But what I do here in Ireland, in Westport, or Valmar, or Valmar, the, 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 my, my shopping choices, uh, this all has an effect. We've all heard of the sweatshops in Southeast Asia. Uh, I saw a fellow recently at a funeral. He had this wonderful pair of shoes. They were, um, I forget what, what uh, they were trainers. I forget what, Nike or one of those. And uh, the cost of them, uh, he was telling me, was so expensive. But he, um, I was just thinking they were probably made for a few dollars in a sweatshop somewhere. But just this idea that that we must become more and more conscious of, of the, what we do here has an effect on the, on the other side of the world. What Francis said in the lecture, when nature is viewed solely as a source of profit and gain, then obviously it has serious consequences. Uh, there's no question about that. And um, why all of this, just to try and tie it in before we have a few questions, I, I, I go back to Oscar Blessed Oscar O'Meara now, uh, 
when he said in, in El Salvador in 1979, when the church hears the cry of the oppressed, it cannot but denounce the social structures that give rise to and perpetuate the misery of, uh, from which the cries arise. This is gospel, this is the gospel command to love one another. That, you know, that, that wonderful um, um, final, final um, in dialogue about the last judgment. And as much as you've done this to the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you've done it to me. You know, there was no taking of boxes. There was no, did you go here on Sunday? Did you go there on Monday? It was just, did you, did you treat people with respect? Did you, did you look out for the most marginalized? Did you look out for those who are starving? Did, you know, and as much as you did this to the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. And that's, that's the frightening one for, for, for me uh, when that day comes, is, is how will we measure up to that. Uh, of course, when you do dedicate yourself to the lives and to attending to the lives of people in need, uh, very often there's a whole school of people who will try to uh, divert you for different reasons. Uh, some of them because the status quo is what they want. Uh, they want the thing as it was. Ecuador elected a president in 2007 who totally and utterly turned the thing upside down. And there was a, the government, the state, was so utterly corrupt that they tried to shoot him, they tried to do everything they could, but they haven't got him yet. He's a three-term president, which is unheard of in Latin America. But, but he is doing something right. I noticed in my time in the slum there that rather than us um, and my colleagues uh, looking to provide uh, education facilities, more and more the money was coming on board from the state. So this money that was siphoned off to, to Switzerland or to Miami beforehand, and there is, to, there is a story told of a president in Bolivia who was sacked as president and was actually photographed carrying um, refuse sacks of cash to his private jet on his way to Geneva. And uh, it, you know, so it's but when you do involve yourself in, in the quest of those most in need, um, there will be people who will try to distract you. Some would say it's not what, uh, it's not what Jesus said, that we should be totally de um, dedicated in a different way, that we're distracting ourselves by involving ourselves in the plight of the poor. Some would say, say for, for personal or greedy uh, motivations. But Don Haldo Camara was an archbishop in Recife in Brazil. <coughs> utterly inspirational man. But he said this one time, and it is unforgettable. He says, you know, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. But when I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. And it's so, it's so true. Um, they will seek to discredit. If you um, tinker with the system that, that benefits certain people, then you will be discredited one way or another. Uh, and that's unfortunate. <coughs> Laudato C, Pope Francis and, and um, Cardinal Turkson said certainly we should be concerned lest other living beings be treated irresponsibly, but we should be particularly indignant at the enormous inequalities in our midst. We fail to see that some are mired in desperate and degrading poverty with no way out. And that's one of the things, there's no options. I always had the option to fly to knock. They never had the option to fly anywhere. There's no option, no way out. While others have not the faintest idea of what to do with their possessions, vainly showing off their supposed superiority and leaving behind them so much waste, which if they were the of mentality. Just before I finish, this was a book that was written a few years ago. My parish priest, Jagra Makanan, my first parish priest, one from now, he's dead now, God rest him. He, told, he went to Alaska for a year one time and he told a story of how, um, how they would go fishing salmon in the river. They'd go out to the middle of the river, cut a hole in the middle of the river, and they would put down their fishing gear, and you could see the salmon underneath the salmon run, and they'd be fishing away, fishing away. But at a certain number, they packed up their gear and they went home. And Jagadon, who wasn't very <coughs> kind, in fairness, he wasn't, but his Western mentality would make him question, but well, look at them, there's a of salmon down there. Why don't we fill, fill, fill the box and sell them and make more money and catch more salmon and sell more? But the, uh, the Eskimos 
forget what tribe they were, but the, their mentality was, we're just taking off. We take what we need, and we leave nature to its own devices. And uh, I think there's a, there's a great wisdom in that. There's a great wisdom. Elizabeth Johnson, the American theologian, said, wrote a book one time, Ask the Beasts. It's going back to Job in the Old Testament. And Job was talking about creation, and God said, well, if you want to know about creation, ask the beasts. Maybe nature teaches us. And uh, that was the lesson of the uh, Eskimos, that we'll just take what we need and, and, and don't exploit. And I think that's something that, that was a book that, that, that is a radically different way of seeing the world. You know, just just taking, and the economy of enough it speaks of. You know, you don't, we're always hearing about growing our GDP and growing economic growth, but this is a completely different way of seeing, seeing the world. Just the economy of enough, of having enough, and not needing any more. So, um, are there any questions? I should have asked a long time ago, I'm sorry. Really in the the money is, 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 is the locals are doing the labour, and the money is going out of the country anyway. Oh yeah, absolutely. Now there is one Ecuadorian company, Alvaro Noboa is the name of the man, and he's one of the wealthiest men in the world. And he set up a company. Um, he's ran for president seven times, unelected. Uh, he, he's he's uh, and I think he's going again this time. Oh, no, no, he's not. No. But um, but. He, 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 that's the, there are two uh, Ecuadorian companies, Favorita and Noboa, but other than that, the transnationals dominate everything. So you can't really do anything without the say so of the transnationals. So you can't, like we did, me, our <coughs> grandparents did have a vegetable patch, and they grew the vegetables for the year, and they had a couple of hens. That they, you know that you, you, you it wasn't you didn't make anything on it, but at least you had food. They would just, just enough. Yes, in the country they would. In, and that was the country. irony, not in the towns. And when they, when uh, Valerio Stasio and his ilk went to the country and heard the people into the city, actually they left behind a better existence. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Because, because they'd have the chickens under the table, mm -hmm. they'd have the eggs in the morning, mm -hmm. they'd have the banana tree out in the back, yeah. they'd have the oranges, they'd have the, the um, watermelons, they'd have the badea, mm -hmm. all the different, different you're right, you know, often left behind uh, an existence which was poor, but, but much better than the slum. Much better, you're right, absolutely. But it wasn't in any ways, um, it wasn't profitable in any ways. But it no, was but it, 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 it would, exactly. Yeah. It's all together. Exactly, yeah. 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 I'm wondering, what was the transition like for you leading ministry in Ecuador and that context that you had so well described and coming back to the Irish church? It's going well. It's, going, it's very hard, I'll tell you the truth. Um, it's, it's a different, it's just a different, um, it's just so different. Everything is so different. Um, society, church, everything is just so different. And, um, and listen, the mission is everywhere. The mission is everywhere. But, but, but it is very different. I mean, it's going fine in five years on, but uh, it, um, it does take time, there's no question. It does. Colour the way you would it does. as a priest. It, do, it, it, it does, it, it does, mm -hmm. it has to. I mean, and it's amazing too, I talked about the stench of poverty. It's amazing how quickly it becomes part of your life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, towards the end people will come, uh, couples maybe on the round world trip and they come for a week to work in a soup kitchen and you'd set them up with the work and, you know, and they, they would remind you of this stage, but you had become so accustomed to it that it was just life when you got out of it. Uh, but there was the other thing too I'd say, <clears throat> and I don't know why, but there was never, I know mental health is very much an, uh, an, an issue and I'm very much involved, and, and I recognise that it is an issue. We seem to be living in a more stressed time, a more anxious time. But it was never an, an issue. <coughs> and, um, in, in, in my experience, despite the abysmal poverty, 
despite the queue at the door at seven o'clock looking for a dollar, dollar fifty to buy rice for dinner, uh, it was always, it was always, uh, it was, despite the fact that it was hand to mouth, there wasn't that kind of anxiety that we, that we experience now in, in society. I never, I never experienced that. I, I don't want to generalize in any way, shape, or form, and it's not a racial thing or anything like that. But I suppose studies need to be done. You wonder why people are at such a low end. Um, but maybe, maybe everybody was in the same boat, and maybe they were just, just uh, not caught up in the. I don't know. I don't know. But that was just my own experience. Uh, Did you? Uh, <coughs> thanks for the talk. By the way. Lovely photographs as well, you know, they were sad. Did you feel that you'd done something useful out there? When I went there, I felt utterly useless. Uh, when I went walked down that day down to George Washington and down that street, I felt useless. I looked around in the parish and I thought, where on earth, what can I do? A farmer from my mother's, where are we going to start? You know, and the needs were just so overwhelming. They were just right in my face, so overwhelming, I thought, I better just go home again, you know, because I thought, this is pointless, who am I cutting? But one of the greatest lessons of my own life, and, and uh, something that I, I shouldn't say I wouldn't have experienced here, but I do, honestly, I can honestly tell you that God always provides. And I don't mean that in a pious way or anything. I really believe that concretely, mm -hmm. because in that awful situation, God did provide, and, 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 and things started to happen, and people came on board, and little by little in different sectors, and we started to, to develop one sector, and then we moved to another sector, and people would come on board, and we'd become energized by it, and we'd have catechesis teams, we'd have the soup kitchen, all of these things, and it would just happen. And it wasn't me, because I, I wouldn't be able to do it on that scale. I, it just happened. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, I would say that, that I'm totally and utterly convinced of that. Maybe in Ireland, beforehand, I, I would have maybe had the experience more in books or God's providence and all of that. But I honestly do believe now, there's no question in my mind, that, that God in some ways used the five loaves and two fishes of my life and, and, and did something. Um, that worked, that helps people. And did the authorities, what did the authorities think of you? Were you doing good or were you troublemakers? Uh, it depends, it depends on which authorities. Uh, a lot of them were very, very, uh, um, very positive towards you. Okay? They recognised that you were trying to do some good. The, the municipal, the municipal authority, the mayor, uh, which we hassled all the time for different reasons, uh, he, at the end of the day, he was always hugely positive because he saw that at the bottom of it, we weren't there for ourselves. We were there to try and do some, some good for somebody. Now, there were other authorities that wouldn't have wanted us anywhere near the, the, the parishes where we were. Um, like, for instance, Colin McGuinness, the, the man from the Hebrides, he went to um, a parish in Quito in the 80s, the uh, Comité del Pueblo, which was dominated by communists at the time, Marxists. And uh, they tried to have him hung, drawn, and quartered. And he, he was literally almost assassinated. And um, he had to go and hide into Colombia, of all places, Colombia. But anyway, he was ushered out of uh, actually in case he worked in that parish as well, but much later. But um, but he was he had to be shaded out of the parish, brought to Columbia until the things were settled. So there were interest groups in these areas that were uncomfortable at the input from outside. They would have wanted the oppression to continue. They would have wanted people to believe that this was the way it was and it couldn't change. And that suited them. It certainly suited this Valerio Stasio, who later became a pastor for the, um, the Evangelical Church. He built a little church he could well afford to build a man, a <laughs> uh, cathedral, but actually just built a small little church. Most of it was a car park. And every Monday morning, uh, he, he would have his service or whatever liturgy, and, uh, and it was jam-packed for fear. People would just be there because they were afraid not to be seen there. And uh, Valerio would, would, do, would shout and roar about things of God. And then on um, Tuesday, he'd kill people, and Wednesday, he'd kill people, and Thursday, he'd kill people. But it was a kind of a 
contradiction, but he was certainly was not um, not in any way happy with the input from outside because it upset his status quo. And finally, my last question: Has the government any interest in solving the problem? The government, yeah. Since two thousand and seven, the the election of Raphael Correa, who was trained in Belgium and the United States, uh, an economist, uh, things have changed. Um, now people have labelled him everything under the sun. As I said, they've tried, they've tried to assassinate him many times. They've labelled him a communist, a socialist, or all of this. Actually, all he all he's tried to do is try to keep some of the money in the country for the Ecuadorian people. Um, he's talked about nationalizing natural resources. Ecuador is one of the largest, I think fourth largest natural resources in the world. It should be supremely wealthy. But all of these funds were siphoned off to, to Geneva or to Miami. And, uh, and, and um, so Rafael Correa said, well, we're going to privatize this thing. And we're going to keep the money here. Now, we don't want to hear the word privatization here in Europe because it's a bad word. But actually, it did keep some of the money in Ecuador, a lot of it. So much so that, that schools started to be built in, in slums where you would never expect any government to show any interest ever. Schools sprung up, health centers started to be built, um, things that governments should do started to be done. So he's a three term president, which is unheard of in Latin America. He has 60% of support even still after. after 10 years, the elections in 06, 11 years. So it's, um, he's doing something right, but, um, but uh, people would label him an extremist and this, that, and the other because he was, I suppose, upsetting uh, a status quo that suited 5% of the population.